Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 154, February 26th to March 3rd, 1864. Last week, we talked about George Thomas's probe toward Joseph Johnson in Dalton, Georgia. We will watch Thomas, as he's not going to be well-received by Grant and Sherman, but will go on to have one of the more complete victories of the war at Nashville later in the year. We also talked about the Battle of Alusti. You probably did not know that the 54th Massachusetts went on to fight again after Wagner, but they participate in the largest battle in the state of Florida. This week, we are going to need to talk cavalry. In Virginia, we need to speak on the Kilpatrick Dahlgren Raid, which is also known as the Dahlgren Affair. Before we do that, though, we need to find out what happens to Suey Smith when he finally arrives at the party that was supposed to be the Meridian Campaign. This will result in the Battle of Okalona and another notch in Nathan Bedford Forrest's belt. But, of course, before we do that, we do need to talk about our Patreon content here and our last two episodes we did a statistical analysis and a movie review that movie review was the red badge of courage starring audie murphy from the 50s and now coming up here as we approach march we finally have our beguiled 1971 and 2017 movie comparison and review and With that being ready, obviously kind of played it up a little bit in some previous episodes here, but we finally have that ready. It's good to go. There's a lot of really interesting content with that one. So if that sounds like something that would interest you, that will be posted here as we get into March. There is a link to the Patreon in the show description. And of course, those proceeds do go toward the general upkeep of the show, and they are greatly appreciated. So if you remember the plan during the Meridian campaign as to have cavalry at the time, the largest contingent of cavalry assembled in the West for the Union sweep down quickly in an advance of the infantry and capture Meridian. Well, this did not happen, not that the infantry necessarily needed their mounted arm. If you recall, Leonidas Polk is the commander in the area and he actually pulls his men back into Alabama because Mobile is considered to be a more high priority target. They've kind of given up sort of on Mississippi really and this does lead to a lot of Mississippi troops deserting the Confederacy as a matter of fact especially with the fall of Vicksburg kind of deemed irrelevant right. You're not going to be able to reconnect to the Trans-Mississippi Kirby Smith is kind of on his own, so Leonidas Polk does pull a lot of those troops back. Smith was waiting for an additional brigade before he moved forward. 7,000 men in all was going to be a problem for the Confederates in the region. Here's the thing, though. Suey Smith is going to be not well-liked by William T. Sherman, but had been placed in charge of the cavalry at the behest of Grant. There was a little quarrel between the two. Even though Grierson was going to accompany the raid, and he was considered to be good on local knowledge from his 1863 foray into Mississippi, that was still going to be a problem for Sherman, who's going to plan to potentially replace Smith with Grierson at some point, but... Those plans are not necessarily confirmed. You see, we have talked about Soey Smith, but maybe you have not remembered. He had served in infantry command, but was often sick. He will go on to be a successful engineer after the conflict. In his defense, the timeline that was laid out by Sherman would have been a tough task to keep, especially in the winter. But the object was going to be clear get into the fertile prairie region of Mississippi, and wreak as much havoc as possible, targeting especially railroads. 
This region of the Magnolia State was going to be very important for the survival of the Confederacy, being a very big food producer. In that regard, it is kind of like the Shenandoah Valley, destruction of which would be a win for the Union and loss for the South. We talked previous in the Meridian campaign about Sherman and his hard war stance. Now, some have pointed to the death of his son as a cause for the sudden change of heart, but we can also look at an event from not too long ago. Chalmers had raided Colliersville, Tennessee, and had almost captured Sherman. Indeed, he had captured some of his personal effects before the fiery general was saved. Wanting to eliminate actual Confederate cavalry, as well as guerrilla operations in the region, would have seemed to be a good deal for Kump. Smith would at first see an easy sledding in his raid as the mounted troops left Colliersville. His brigades would include George Waring, Lieutenant Colonel William Hepburn, and the Illinois regiments used in the Grierson raid, as well as a 3rd Brigade under Lafayette McCrillis. Waring had been the drainage engineer responsible for Central Park in New York. He would go on to design sewer systems in Memphis and New York to improve sanitary conditions. McCrillis had the 72nd Indiana, who you remember as being part of the Lightning Brigade, which is now scattered, as well as several loyal Tennessee regiments. McCrillis had been a veteran of Pea Ridge and other campaigns, a lawyer before the war and after the war, so he was a capable officer. Grierson would serve as a kind of de facto wing commander during the battle, so hold on to that thought. The column would cause much in terms of destruction, but he would also take on formerly enslaved refugees. Now, not to sound heartless, because obviously those people needed assistance, but a trail of non-combatants was not going to be conducive to a quick cavalry action, especially one that Sherman had requested. Smith would cite a pamphlet reportedly that had been distributed by Union agents promising their assistance. In the meantime, he was also not going to be very happy with some of the looting that was going on by his men, so things were not really going accordingly. Someone else who was not happy about the looting and the raid in general would be Nathan Bedford Forrest. We talked about how Forrest requested transfer away from Bragg, and maybe so he did not end up having to kill him, as he said he would. The Wizard of the Saddle would have to reform a command not for the first time in the war. In fact, he arrives in Mississippi with only a couple hundred men. Forrest would interestingly be under the command of Stephen Dill Lee, who had been given the mounted troops in the state following his successful parole from Vicksburg. You remember Stephen Dill Lee, of course. He is the individual who bests Sherman at Chickasaw Bayou, and you probably maybe would also consider Sherman wanting to maybe get even with Stephen Dill Lee as well for that dark mark on his record. In fact, actually, Sherman would be opposed to the parole of Stephen Dill Lee, maybe again citing his experience from Chickasaw Bayou, but he wouldn't want to give this officer back to the Confederacy. And he kind of has a point, right? He really was the only competent officer during some of those campaigns especially around Vicksburg, but can't just deny somebody their parole. Even though Lee was technically the superior and Polk in overall command, the Culifer Forest would request to Polk that Lee support him, which is probably par to the course for the Confederate Cavalry General. Recruiting heavily into West Tennessee, Forrest would be able to cobble together a new command that would number a couple thousand. He took all comers, in fact, bringing in a guerrilla band under Soul Street, who was notorious in the region. Chalmers would be placed under Forrest, which at first had the potential to be rocky, but the two would end up working well together. Under Chalmers would be T.H. Bell's Tennessee Cavalry Brigade, commanded by Clark Bartow, and Jeff Forrest's command, Nathan's youngest brother. Bartow, you remember, had been part of the Grierson Raid, having the best opportunity early to throw a wrench into that operation. 
Robert McCullough would command another brigade, which included a unit of cavalry commanded by W.W. Faulkner, for you literature fans. McCullough would be a capable officer under Forrest known as Black Bob. There would be a final brigade of mostly Tennessee cavalry under R.V. Richardson. So all in all, a fairly good-sized force from arriving with essentially no one. He would still be outnumbered by Smith's command, but additional reinforcements from Lee's cavalry would even the odds. Forrest is still going to have his name, which is going to be worth quite a lot. We talked in other episodes how Thomas Jackson might not have been a morale boost, but Stonewall certainly was. Forrest we can classify in that category. There's going to be plenty of times during the war where he's going to essentially use his name to try to force garrisons to surrender. Now, especially as the strategic situation kind of changes, and if there is available naval support, like say in the Fort Pillow campaign, that's not always going to be the case where garrisons will surrender. But we have seen it before how Forrest is going to use this ruse, and even some of his subordinates will start to use the ruse of Forrest to try to make sure they can end things without being too bloody. And obviously, especially as the war progresses, that's going to be a big goal for the Confederates. And this region, even more so than, say, the East, they're really down on mountain power, and there's a lot of individuals who have deserted the Confederate army, and they're turning over to the Union cause. So it's going to be kind of an uphill battle here. February 21st, 1864, we'll see the two-side skirmish at a bridge known as Ellis. While not much is known exactly about this engagement, including casualties, it is important because this is where Smith is going to stop and make a retrograde back toward the town of Okalona. From Okalona, he would make his way back toward Pontoc, and then north toward safer Mississippi territory, eventually maybe gaining Colliersville outside of Memphis. But what exactly convinced Smith to stop? Well, there was Confederate cavalry under Jeff Four skirmishing with him. There was unknown troop strength, and that could pose a problem. If Smith had been allowed to take the bridge, it would have been potentially bad for Forrest and his link-up with Lee, but Smith would also have other reasons to turn back. Remember, he had taken on a lot of refugees and was not happy with the looting. Wanting things to come to an end, he considered his job done and headed his command back north. And to be fair to Smith, Sherman doesn't need him. He doesn't need him to actually capture Meridian. Obviously, he doesn't make it there, right? So he's kind of doing this action without having really a purpose. You know, he's torn up some railroads. He's done his job in his book. Forrest would wish to pursue running into the Union rear guard. Remember, Forrest is a psychological weapon, so this could also have been a part of the decision-making. Union officers were not happy with the retreat, but they felt better once they had made their way to Okalona and a more defensible terrain. Oddly enough, this was a second opportunity of Smith to really make an impact on the campaign and the region in general. Forrest had chased the enemy with only a handful of men, including his escort. In open terrain, Smith could have turned and trapped Forrest with his numbers, but this opportunity was lost. As the two sides bedded down, neither was really expecting too much of a fight, except, of course, Forrest. Forrest would wish to begin the violence again the next day, even with the Federals holding a stronger position. He would begin to skirmish with his small command against the 4th U.S. Cavalry. Bartow's command was coming in from the east and could therefore hit the Federals in two directions. By this time, Gerson had taken command of the rear guard with units of McCrillis's brigade. He deployed these regiments to meet the threat. Forrest reportedly would ride over to Bartow to lead the attack personally. In some sources, he rode alone to the Tennessee men to do so. Of course they would charge, rushing through the town of Okalona in the process. It was written that every man in that charge was a forest, but despite initial success, they would need to dismount to engage the regulars. These Union counterparts would charge, but be repulsed in the process. Bartow, combined with Forrest's escort and McCullough's command, arriving in the field, would force enough pressure on the Yankees 
causing some to break in panic. Overall, Gerson was able to hold things together, but he would have to withdraw up the Pontotoc Road, despite some reinforcing units. The supporting battery during this action was only able to save one gun, spiking the rest. Waring, who was next in line, would turn his command around and create a new defensive position. Retreating Federals would withdraw through their comrades to get to safety, and this As you can imagine, during the Civil War was going to be a very complicated maneuver. There's plenty of instances where there are less experienced units that when facing a retreating comrade coming through their ranks, they're also going to kind of have that contagion spread and they're going to retreat. However, if you have more veteran troops, they're more likely to stand. And if it's an orderly withdrawal, as we believe Gerson conducted, then it's going to make things a lot easier. Forrest would try to take the new line Waring made head-on. He would deploy McClellan to the left and Jeffrey Forrest to the right of the road, pressing them onward. This was unfortunate for both officers. McClellan would be wounded and knocked out of the action. Jeffrey Forrest would be hit in the neck and die in his brother's arms. Now Nathan had essentially raised Jeff, him being the youngest brother, so the loss was incredible. The bombastic officer would immediately try to get revenge on the enemy. He would have several horses shot from under him during the action. Dr. Cowan would famously write that he would come upon Forrest, outnumbered and dueling several Union horsemen. The doctor would call on part of McCullough's command to save the general, lest he be overwhelmed. During this engagement, Forrest would personally kill three enemy troopers. Waring would make a final stand, facing the now tired and ammunition low Confederates. His men would actually charge the pursuers, but Forrest is able to cobble together a defense in time to throw his enemy back. Additional Confederate units were arriving on the field, and Suey Smith was still at the head of the column. Union troopers would escape, and the tired Confederates would hold the field. Smith was actually criticized for remaining out of the fight, oddly enough. Sherman would call his raid a failure, something he refuted for the rest of his life. He did throw some blame on part of his command, including the 7th Indiana, who he called cowards, so overall it's not really a good look for Smith. His command would limp back into friendly territory with low morale. Forrest was also criticized, despite his victory on the field. He had not waited for Lee. Had he done so, it could have been an even larger success for the Confederates. Casualties were pretty one-sided, with 388 on the part of the Union against 144 on the side of the Confederates. Besides defending the key Mississippi Prairie area, it would also add to the growing lore around Forrest, who is going to continue to make a name in that region. There's something to be said that the area was known as Forest Cavalry Department. So as we continue with our cavalry-heavy episode here, we need to talk about the Kilpatrick Dahlgren Raid, which is also known as the Dahlgren Affair. So when we last talked the region, activity had relatively ceased, but there had also been an escape at Libby Prison. As we have highlighted before, the soft shell of the Confederate interior was on full display by several events already covered. Judson Kilpatrick, always good for some adventure, decided that it may be time to launch a shot at Richmond, which was lightly defended. Remember that there had been a scare during the Chancellorsville campaign, where Kilpatrick essentially got to the outskirts of the city. Now, Lincoln had been interested in potentially capturing Jefferson Davis and had heard that Richmond was lightly defended by escaped prisoners. Remember, too, that Benjamin Butler is also of the opinion that Richmond is not really well defended, which resulted in the Battle of Morton's Ford. Like at Libby Prison, it was considered that maybe the prisoners on Belle Isle could be freed as part of the raid. Richmond burned and potentially Jeff Davis killed, as we will soon talk about. Now, it's also, this is pretty sound logic, right? It kind of seems ridiculous that this raid is launched in the first place because you would probably have more heavily 
defended areas, but you did just have a whole bunch of prisoners essentially walk out of prison and then safely make it their way back to Union lines. So that's pretty strong evidence that there's going to be a real potential here to actually have this thing succeed. Kilpatrick would conspire with Ulrich Dahlgren for this raid after getting the green light from the Lincoln administration, especially Edwin Stanton. In fact, Kilpatrick had been given an audience with Lincoln directly, bypassing command. His plan was going to be live off the land and capture Richmond with 4,000 cavalry. Additionally, Benjamin Butler would provide infantry support moving on the city. Dahlgren would lead a column of 500 cavalry, eager to get back into the action after losing a leg earlier in the war. This column was intended to sweep down south of Richmond and hit the city from the south. In want of healthy horses, there was a jumbling of commands, so there was a lack of cohesion amongst the men. Kilpatrick would set out with 3,500 men trying to do damage in the railroads as he went. Unfortunately for him, he failed to contain the word spreading of his purpose. Remember that Grierson, during his famous raid into Mississippi, was very conscious of this, whereas Kilpatrick, not so much. This is also probably because Grierson, just in general, has a better plan of action, right? He does seem to put a lot of thought into how he's going to pull off his raid. He has to adjust on the fly. He has contingencies, right? Kilpatrick doesn't really seem to have that, and somebody whose nickname is Kill Cavalry, well, it kind of you get what you pay for, really. The cavalryman did not even think about the fact that he would need to feed and transport the prisoners he rescued in the city. So that's probably a big oopsie, right? Like, you're going to free these individuals who are probably going to be malnourished, right? Prison camps, they have a pretty good idea. They're not necessarily the best conditions, right? But he doesn't even have any way to feed them or even transport them out of the city, right? You would imagine that if you struck at Richmond, there would be a big convergence of rebel infantry, rebel cavalry. You're going to have to get out of there pretty quickly. And if you have somebody who's not at peak physical condition, they're not going to be able to just run alongside your cavalry as they go. He would get to the outskirts of Richmond again, but Wade Hampton was launching a pursuit and the various Home Guard units were mobilizing, making things that much more difficult. Kilpatrick would thus briefly wait for Dahlgren before realizing he should move back into friendly territory, eventually making his way to Yorktown. His command was actually attacked by Hampton's command, expediting the withdrawal. Dahlgren, in the meantime, had setbacks of his own. There was opportunity to capture some reserve artillery, and maybe even Robert E. Lee himself but these would not come to fruition. He would have issues crossing the James, as would usually happen during winter months. Reportedly, he would execute a black guide, blaming him for a setback. Now, I have actually seen certain cases where there's evidence for that, there's evidence against that. You know, oddly enough, it's kind of like, if you think about the Lawrence, Kansas raid, where you have... Quantrell murdering the individuals that help him through regions that he's unfamiliar with. Do you think maybe he might have done that? Sure, like, is he capable of that? You know, obviously there's a lot of frustration. But in an interesting parallel, you just don't know if it's necessarily 100% true. Also, realizing the Confederates were ready for him, he would turn back and head to friendly lines. The 9th Virginia Cavalry, as well as elements of the Home Guard, would ambush him and elements of his command at Walkerton in King and Queen County, Virginia, on March 2nd. In the action, Dahlgren would be killed and most of his men taken prisoner. Dahlgren would be asked to surrender, but he will decline, attempting to draw his pistol. Now the controversy would arise from the papers that were found on Dahlgren's body. Upon being searched by a 13-year-old of the Home Guard, it was found that there was a document that outlined freeing the prisoners and then releasing them on Richmond for general destruction. 
Additionally, there was a document that outlined Davis and the cabinet were to be killed on the spot. Obviously, this was not taken well by the Southern populace, especially after the Davis administration released the documents. Meade would deny that they were legitimate, but there is evidence that Stanton had approved this course of action. A member of the BMI who had been with Dahlgren would confirm as much. Especially the assassination of Jefferson Davis might have been inspiration for John Wilkes Booth and his assassination of Lincoln in 1865. Here we have a section describing the ambush from the Times-Dispatch. The most important blow, which has yet been struck, the daring raiders who attempted to enter the city on Tuesday last, was wielded by Lt. Pollard of the 9th Virginia Cavalry on Wednesday night about 11 o'clock in the neighborhood of Walkerton in King and Queen County. Lt. P., with the greater portion of his own company, had been watching the movements of the enemy all day on Wednesday in King William, and ascertained that night that Dahlgren, with about 200 of his deluded followers, had crossed the Mattapani at Aylitz. With his own men, he crossed over and followed the retreating raiders. On reaching the forks of the road, a few miles above Walkerton, Lt. P. learned that the enemy had taken this river road, leading to that place. Leaving a few men to follow on after them, he quitted the main road and the larger portion of his force at his disposal, and by a circuitous route, and forced march, he succeeded in throwing himself in front of the enemy and awaited his approach. In the meantime, he had been joined by the home guards of King and Queen and a few of Robin's battalion. A little before 11 o'clock at night, the enemy approached on the road in which they were posted. A fire was at once opened upon them, but their leader, Colonel Dahlgren, relying perhaps upon his numbers, or stung by chagrin at his failure to capture Richmond, determined to force his way through and at once forming his men, ordered a charge, which he led himself. It proved, however, a fatal charge to him, for in the onset he was pierced with a ball and fell dead. After his fall, the command could not be rallied, but were soon thrown into confusion. Our boys, noticing this, availed themselves of the opportunity it afforded, and used it to the best advantage. Dashing in among the discommitted foe, they succeeded in capturing ninety prisoners, 35 Negroes, and 150 horses. The body of Dahlgren also fell into their hands, and on his person was found the papers, which we published below, disclosing the diabolical schemes which the party had in view, in making the late, and to them, disastrous raid. Unfortunately, there was some mistreatment of Ulrich Dahlgren's body following the release of the papers. The body and his wooden leg were put on display, and his finger cut off. We have talked prior about Elizabeth Van Loo, who was a spy for the Union and did good work in supporting the Union soldiers kept at prisons in Richmond. She, along with other pro-Union Richmond citizens, would disinter his body and give it a more proper burial. The raid would have very little to show as a whole besides some damaged track. It would spark, of course, continued Confederate operations against Lincoln, which, as we will see, will eventually prove to be successful. So we're going to go ahead and call it a day there. Today we talked about the Battle of Okolona, which is another W in the column for Forrest, increasing his legend, albeit at the cost of his brother. Remember that Mississippi is going to still be important for the food production of the Confederacy. We also talked about the Dahlgren Affair, which was an ambitious cavalry raid by Kilpatrick, which included eliminating not only Jefferson Davis, but also his entire cabinet. Next week we have a few odds and ends. We need to talk about what George Armstrong Custer is up to in Virginia, supporting actually the actions that we had here today in the Dahlgren Raid. We also need to talk about Andersonville and the beginning of the Red River Campaign, and also Ulysses Grant taking the reins. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, as well as Patreon and Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Feedback's always welcome. Questions, comments, concerns, the email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening, and have a great week.